8,000 miles to Tap Town. My name is Finbar and this is Traygun Renaissance Man. Man, what an episode this is going to be. Traygun is a Renaissance man, a, someone who traverses knowledge and experience in delivering truly episodic works. Fueled by discovery, his ever evolving approach is unique as it is compelling. Um, with his trusty partner, the war guitar by his side, he delivers music that shape shifts a number of dimensions. Um, whether touring with his band, King Crimson, KTU, Trey Gun Project, scoring, coaching and consulting. Um, Trey can only be described by me as a musical juggernaut wrapped in a humbling and welcoming persona. Um, this week on 8,000 Miles to Tap Town, we got to sit down with this legend and talk about his music, his art, his coaching, um, basically everything that is Trey Gun and how the art of touch style really helped lay a foundation for where he is today. It was a fab episode. I loved it. I hope you will too. Trey Gunn. Trey Gunn, it's an honor to have you on the show. I feel like Wayne's World. We're not worthy. We're not worthy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not worthy to be on your show. <laughs> I'm happy to be here. This, this no, is mate, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's fabulous. It's so, so great to have someone like yourself on the show. You know, it's uh, one of the icons of the, um, of the instrument and, and of music. So, you know, thanks so much for your time. Absolutely. So, buddy, like, you know, I know you've done a lot of these sort of things and people have got to hear your stories and know all about your background and bits and pieces. But, you know, 8,000 Miles to Tap Town for me is about trying to race to the surface this incredible subculture, this instrument that's born so many different careers, uh, inspired so many different musical directions, uh, new musical styles. And, uh, you know, as one of the core pioneers of this instrument, you know, I just sort of... Uh, if we can go back um, to, you know, I know you were classically trained in piano. Is that right? You, you started on the piano? Uh, yeah. I mean, it sounds funny to say classically trained. I just played piano and the music was classical. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's, what you, you know, that's what you did. That's what well, you that did. sounds good anyway, classically trained. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I did end up, I did end up uh, in a classical music program in, in, in university because I wanted to study music. And... Um, there weren't that many options in the early 80s. You kind of either went GIT, Berkeley, or regular conservatory. And I, I use that term lightly because I wasn't at Juilliard or Oberlin or one of the, the, the badass schools. But I, 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 yeah, so the, I, I, can, I can put myself in the classical category here and there. Yeah. But and what, what blew me away when I was researching you is that, which I just love, is this iconoclastic thing that you're in a punk band studying classical uh, or, or composition. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I ended up, um, you know, like I say, I wanted to, I wanted to, you know, I came through many different genres and styles, but I was pretty much a punk rocker in my late teens. And the, the, the mentality of the punk rocker, and, and I still accept it, and kind of, you know, hold it up there is, um, I don't have to, I, we don't have to use clean language here, right? No, I go for it. Yeah, why okay. not? Was, was fuck learning what you're supposed to do, just do it. And so I kind of was with that for a little bit, but then to me, it just didn't make any sense that if I was going to be a, if I wanted to uh, be a journalist or a writer, I would kind of want to know what verbs what's the difference between a verb and an adjective so that yeah. was my interest in wanting to actually study a little bit more music and just have my musical vista open up more and um that was pretty much the opposite of the punk rock thing but when i went to university i i uh 
decided to study composition because I wasn't that great of a player and I didn't really want to spend my energies getting proficient on an instrument playing music that I had no intention of playing. So that's kind of why I, I, I went into composition. But I felt like if I didn't balance that out with just like the raw rock attitude in some way, I, that would be a mistake. So that's kind of what I was doing. I was playing in a band called Punishment Farm on the weekends and, uh, you know, studying Beethoven and Mozart and Bartok during the day. <laughs> so you're taking punishment, learning it, then expelling it on stage. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And some of my teachers even, thought, they even said to me, like, what are you doing here? Kind of like, why are you here? Why don't you just move to LA and get in the band? I was like, I, I'm not done with this yet. I want, I want, I don't know. Something, but something this, compels to me, me there's something beautiful, and that is the diverse lines of inquiry. It's the synthesis of different things and different experiences is what creates that unique spark, you know, like at least to me. And, and you know, I just obviously I, I don't know whether that's right or not, but to me it's that that's what makes you unique and individual and, and original mm. and, you know, mm. Mm. To me, that's the thing that should be celebrated, you know? Yeah, I agree. Well, it was a different time, too. It was a time where the, the even like studying jazz or world music wasn't quite accepted in the, in the academic world. Um, and that's just not the case anymore. Within five years of me being done in college, everybody is like diversified, you know, and now you have improvising classical musicians and they don't care whether what the style of the music is, uh, but there was kind of a, you know, even in the even in the the rock and pop worlds, there was a snobbery to your the lane that you're in. Yeah. Now, you you, you, you know, everybody everybody jumps from lane to lane, and and I mean that's probably more of a challenge for a young musician now is how do you deal with all the diversity that you're supposed to be good at. Uh, I'm, I, I suspect. I don't know. It doesn't bother. That doesn't affect me now. <laughs> no, but 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 also, I think you know, you you got into. Well, let's let's. How did you get into the touch style thing? Like, where, where did you get your first yeah. stick? Where did that all yeah. come from? So it's kind of a, it's kind of interesting to me, and and it is interesting re, uh, revisiting it. I played guitar. I played bass. I obviously have played piano, but I kind of moved to the bass and the guitar, electric and acoustic guitar, and. Um, I probably felt most at home as a bass guitarist um, for, for a lot of different reasons. But um, with the guitar, I felt at some point along the way, I felt pretty early on, I felt like no matter what I do, there's this kind of blues sense that comes out of the instrument. And I can be as kind of experimental or as abstract that there's this blues uh, tonality or some something and i it did not fit me it did not suit me and not that i dislike the blues i just didn't suit me and i was kind of trying to figure out what it was and then one day i thought i wonder if it's the tuning because you your hands just you know gravitate for me i, I thought this I, I kind of expressed it like the ghost of eric clapton is always looking over my shoulder even if I'm playing Gang of Four or Iggy Pop or whatever, but but you know it's also Jimmy Page and and w which has that blues sense. It's just in the hands right there. And I thought, and immediately I thought, oh, I heard of this instrument called a Chapman stick. I think it's tuned in fifths. I wonder what that would do. And I kind of looked it up a little bit and was like, oh, it's the bass is in fifths and the thing is in the top is in fourths and. You can't really get your hands on one. And Emmett's down in LA. You could, I could, I was living in Oregon. I could drive down there, but it's like a two or three day drive. And then you, uh, you know what? I don't know. I just kind of got stalled out on it. And then I met Robert Fripp, and he was using a fifth space tuning with a low C on his guitar. And I put that on my instrument. And was like, oh, I was right. This is, this is right for me. And from that day, I've never gone back to fourths on any of my instruments. And so that was the, that was interestingly for me, it was really the tuning of the fifths, you know, that to go into um, this cello, violin, mandolin tuning, um, it wasn't like it kept me from playing the blues. You can play blues licks, but they don't sound quite right. Um, it was more that the, the, the tuning of the fifths just opened up this 
I don't know, open up the tone tonality in the sonic space for me that fit me. Fast forward, um, I was in England already working with Fripp, and he lent me one of his sticks that he had gotten. Uh, I think he even got it before Tony was playing it, and he lent it to me, and I put it on, and um, as soon as I started touching it, I was like, "Gah! This is the instrument that I've been, I've been." I've been trying to do this on all the wrong instruments. Like I've been trying to do this on the piano. I've been, and, and I look back at my older music from the time, uh, which what I spent a lot of my quarantine time archiving old music uh, and getting rid of the tapes and digitizing everything. Um, what I've been trying to do on the bass when I hear the guitar playing, it's like, oh, you just didn't have the right, you didn't actually have the right instrument, that this tapping thing was the right instrument. And so then I was set and I, I, um, the first stick that I got, I altered it so the whole thing was completely tuned in fifths. I didn't, I don't, I don't buy the, I don't buy the double tuning thing personally. And we can talk about that in detail or not, but, yeah. um, um, so that's how the, that's how the stick opened up for me. And the first hour of playing was like, oh, this is amazing. This is, I'm going to be able to do this and that and that. And then like the next day I picked up and was like, oh man, this is going to be a lot of work to be good at it. <laughs> And so it was kind of this, this terror of like, I've committed to, <laughs> I've committed to this thing. And I really, like when I started to look at it, maybe a week later, when I st actually started to really look at my fingers on the strings and thinking about having the kind of facility that I had on other instruments, or even, not even me, but like what a violinist or a clarinetist can do. And to be able to do that here, it, it just felt like 50 years of work. But I, but you know, I was committed to it, so it was kind of this yay and oh shit, what have I done? <laughs> <laughs> Which maybe all of us have that experience. You're laughing like you've had that experience. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I remember back in the when I've because it's been nearly eighteen, nineteen months since I started, and it was like I'm 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 super lucky because you know when I first started learning guitar, I would have to like probably like you get a cassette tape and rewind it and play it and loop it and try and figure out what's going on. And, but you know, I could just ring Jim Wright or Randy up and go, Hey, I've got no idea what I'm doing here and, and got a massive yeah. acceleration. So yeah. it, it did help, but, um, no, there wasn't anything like that. All we had was the free hands book, you know, yeah. which didn't, didn't do anything for me. Um, no, I, but, saw know, that. I was, I was prepped. I was prepped because of how I'd been working with Robert. And, um, I mean, I was prepped to open, up and, and and like find a find a good beginning spot um but you know i don't know how many years later is it now we're we're close to uh 35 years for me wow um it's still there's still a lot of work to do but it's inspiring yeah. work right it's like you, you, you oh yeah 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 and and i don't mean just i don't mean i personally have work to do i mean i do personally have work to do but what i mean is the 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 understanding of what's involved in playing this way and how to get proficient at it is still in a, in a process. You know, I can remember, I can remember one of my earlier interviews and I don't know if we'll ever go, we'll go, we'll go into any of this nonsense or not, but I did an interview where I said, we're not going to have any good players really for 50 years because there's no pedagogy. Nobody knows how to do it. Sure. You want to play yeah. piano? There's 300 years of it. Yeah. And oh man, I got a call from, I got a call from, up the headquarters the next morning, like I, uh, you can't say that. Like, whoa, whoa. <laughs> but I, I, I think it's really true. And even Marcus and I were talking about that recently. That we're getting close to fifty years now. Yeah. And now, now you have, um, you know, there were always good players, but now you actually have people playing really well. Mm. And give it another fifteen years, and it's going to be awesome. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, uh, can we go back to, so you've got your stick and you, obviously through Robert. And before that, did you have a natural inkling for the music that you've produced over time or did the instrument really help develop that? Were you, did you have the idea of what you wanted to create in the instrument facilitated that or was it a, a like a codependent relationship where the instrument helped have, helped you find uh, that? Voice? It was both. It was both. You know, when, when uh, and, and I can speak more directly to this because I've archived all my recordings back to my very first four track wow. cassette piece that I made in 1978. And I hear the same ideas mm. 
that I work now. And even there are some that I started and I was like, you know what? I could still follow that one up. Mm. Uh, so there's some, so cool. you know, it's, it's hard to say, I don't, I, it's hard to say where the intention is because I'm just following where I hear the music going. It's not like I set out on this path in order to get right here with this particular music, but I hear a lot of the same ideas, you know, the, the, um, I hear myself, um, you know, one of the things that's really easy to do on our instrument is to uh, break up the melodic line so that it's spread out over, over multiple octaves. This is very technical or, or just spread out in a, in a unusual way, as opposed to kind of walking around a keyboard up and down. Yeah. Um, and I hear, I hear that early on me trying to figure out like how to, how to do that on bass, how to do that on guitar. So some of the core vocabulary ideas were, were still there. Of course, once I got the instrument, you know, once you have something on hand, it can be just a fuzz box or a sustain pedal or something. You respond to that. And then that, that, that uh, path pathway kind of opens up and you go that way. So the instrument definitely opens up things. And there's things I'm interested in exploring right now that, you could do it on other instruments, but it just wouldn't occur to you. You know, asking from my perspective, is, you know, I spent 30 years producing music and writing music, playing guitar, and I've got into this instrument. And for me, I, f I finally feel like th this instrument is my home. It's like, it's everything. <coughs> even when I was teaching at the conservatorium in Sydney, I was teaching all this theory and all this stuff that I thought was te semi-technical, but on this instrument, it all sort of makes sense. It's like, oh, that mm. over that mm. equals that. And yeah. this time signature is really simple because it's just you're just doing this and it's two cascading things. Whereas before, yeah. trying to work on, on one thing and trying to, it was more theory based. This seems to just, the theory goes out the window and it just becomes all more natural, at least to me anyway. Uh, that's a great way of saying it, you know. And when I think about this, uh, this, rhythm, this rhythmic sense of either um, uh, playing an odd time signatures or multiple rhythms, it's it's just immediately embodied. It's not theoretical. It's like mm. I'm doing these two things, and does it sound good? No. Does it sound good? Yes. Oh, I like this. That yeah, feels good, and exactly. I'm, I'm just doing it. You know, and yeah. and I definitely figured out some ways to do things uh, musically through the instrument that I would never discover. I mean, you would have to go to a keyboard, and it, it just I I wouldn't have played it that way. You know. Yeah. Yeah, and well, if you only had a bass or a guitar, you, you're 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 not able to embody both the things in the same way. So, so did you have yeah. your stick tuned purely in fifths from the lowest note at the bottom? Like, how was that tuned? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I started out. Um, I started out. Uh, well, the bottom uh, the, 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 the 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 bottom bass tuning is the same C C up yeah. in fifths. As the traditional stick. and that was and inverted still, still or was it I, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm always been inverted right um you know, with the center string and the low and that's still what i use right. uh, i cannot remember what the original um top side was but i think i mean what i settled on um was uh, a c and fifths starting right. an octave above right and um you know i went to I had a 10 string very, uh, the, the reason why I'm a little confused about the tuning is I think the first one was a 10 string, but maybe that was Robert's. Maybe the first one I got was a 12 string and I went for a five plus seven because right. outside two strings of the top side did not sound good to me. Right. I felt like I only had three usable strings. So when I went to seven on the top side, then I ended up with five good strings in the middle. And so I had a I had a particular tuning that I used uh, the five plus seven, which I don't I don't I don't like that string configuration anymore. I kind of once once I went to the war guitar and Mark sorted out how to make every string sound incredible, I went yeah. back to the the, the 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 ten string, and then we went to an eight string, and then uh, later on here we're going to talk about what I'm what I'm working on next. Yeah, well, I'm I'm excited to hear about that. <laughs> So, um, um, yeah. you know, and I agree with you. Like for me, when I got the war guitar, it's like oh, every note, I just hit the bottom and the bottom end was so big. You know, I've got a big general yeah, system. Bottom. Oh, and, uh, you know, it was just like blew, blew me away. It was just amazing. Yeah, yeah. 
So um, that was how did all the war guitars... Sorry, go on. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say... Well, I was like, gonna, I was... No, you go, because I'm okay, going to talk cool. about the war guitar, and you're going to yeah, ask like, about the war guitar. Um, so you've got your stick, and then how did the war thing all come about? Where, where did that all start? You know, we, um, um, we can be frank here, right? Uh, we, there were several of us. Uh, basically, um, I was really very close with a, a guy in New York, Frank Jolop, who was kind of in the circle with Randy and, and Jim, but, been, but in New York. And were there anybody else? There was Chris Cunningham, but Chris Cunningham played wildly strange. He had, he had open strings on his stick and was slapping with his thumb. And then, um, so it was mostly Frank and I, and we were feeling like uh, we were doing session works and having a hard time with, originally it was the bass end, getting the bass to sound um, uh, consistently round and full like a bass guitar could do. And so we started kind of examining around with that and, 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 and looking at ways to um, improve the stick. And um, as you do, and we just didn't get a res we just didn't get the positive response from Emmett. And then suddenly um, we heard about this war guitar I, from Randy. Um, I don't know how it came across, how we first came in touch with it. Maybe Frank, Frank, Frank knew Randy and Randy had this war guitar and we both looked at it. I was like, oh my God, that thing looks enormous. And <laughs> we're so used to how the stick goes. Yeah. And, and, and Randy was like, no, man, you guys got to hear this thing. And, you know, Mark, Mark knows what he's doing and they work together. And then Randy said to me, look, get one made, just buy one from Mark. And if you don't like it, I'll buy it from you because I need a second one. And so Frank and I were like, all right, screw it. Let's order two guitars. So we got Mark on the phone and we kind of said what we wanted. We both wanted pretty much the same instrument. We were still, um, and I have it here. I think it's a five plus seven. It's fucking enormous. <laughs> enormous. I've seen the some of the old photos. The headstock is 14 inches long. <laughs> and, and what Mark did was, uh, I mean, the first thing that happened was we ordered it. And when it arrived at my apartment in New York, it looked <laughs> like I had, we got two of them. I had them sent to my house. And then Frank and I were going to decide who gets what. Right. Which one. When it arrived, it looked like I had ordered two <laughs> Fender Rhodes because the cases were so big. It looked like it was a Fender Rhodes. Literally, it was that big. And we opened it up. It was a beautiful case and this beautiful instrument. And it was so enormous. 14-inch headstock. <laughs> uh, he had designed the, the body um, kind of based on the, uh, a banjo situation where the bridge is kind of in the center of the mass. Right. So yeah. below the bridge, there's eight inches of wood. Right. And how heavy um, was it? Oh, it's insanely heavy. So Frank and I got those, and thankfully he liked the the the. I don't think it. I don't think he had a bolt on. No, he didn't do bolt on necks yet, but he had a lighter colored wood, and the instrument was lighter. And I really liked the Paduke one. Um, so we we were happy with that. And then, you know, we started playing it. And we kind of had a we had some issues. Like there were some things that weren't quite the way we would want them. Like the dots weren't in the right place. It was hard to see. Uh, the dots were on one end. So when you looked across to the high strings, you didn't even know what fret it was because of the <laughs> angle that you're looking at and, yeah. um, you know, and, and the heaviness and, but the, and the sound was a crazy, the bass sound is still crazy. And so Mark, we were like, hesitantly, we called Mark and was like, yo, it's really great. But, um, man, you know, the, this and that. And he's like, okay, look, you guys play the thing for a couple of weeks. Make me a list of everything that you would like improved. And uh, I'll make new instruments. And we're like, okay. So we sat down and we just like, we made like two pages of notes. And Frank had all these little details about the tuners and the, the bridge pieces and the pickups and the weight and the, you know, this and that. And we sent it off to Mark thinking, you know, it'll be another. It'll blow his mind. Yeah, yeah. And like four weeks later, we had new instruments. Wow. And he addressed every issue. Wow. And, and so that one, you know, the, it was, the headstock was smaller, the, the back of the body was smaller and he, you know, he, um, there's definitely some magic involved in making an instrument and picking the wood. And he had that and he had kind of the science down, um, 
you know, he did tricky things like getting, um, not necessarily on this instrument, but on the next ones, he would knock on the wood with a little hammer. He would hang it, knock on the wood, and then route out certain things so it would be lighter. And we ended up uh, putting graphite bars on the neck. And so basically, I was totally sold with the guy and, and the instrument. And uh, I, I haven't played anything else since then. And then how was that when your your signature like TGSS model came out, or was that a no, another iteration? No, much later. Much later, we um, we you know Mark had this idea for uh, you know I don't know how the eight string came about. That was the big leap for me was the eight string. I was trying to I, I was playing in this project with um, the projects with 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 uh, with uh, Crimson guys and. I didn't, after, when I was working with the Double Trio Crimson, I kind of realized that there's so much sound on stage that I didn't really need two sets of, two, two, uh, two sets of strings. The only reason you have two sets of strings really is to get two different sounds. Yeah. You could just have a mono instrument. And, and I had Mark put a mono, inst mono switch on my instrument okay. early on because I really like the sound of all the strings together, like a big... Yeah. Um, you know, I remember something. And so as, as, and I know we're jumping around here a bit, but working with the six piece Crimson where Adrian's got his stuff and his guitar synth and Adrian, Robert's got his stuff and all his guitar synth and Tony's got keyboards and, and, and double drummers. And I was like, I don't need two sounds. Yeah. What if I just streamlined the instrument down to an eight string mono? And so, so this is the first one that Mark made for right. me was the eight string mono. Right. And, um, and that that um, I don't know. I can't even remember if this is a TG artist, but I I, I don't think so. And then uh, you know we made that eight string, and um, no, actually it was the black one. It's upstairs. I have the black one. Okay. Um, he wanted he wanted to wean me away from Paduke because it's such a drag to work with. Right. So okay. he made me a bolt on neck, and I didn't like it as much without the Paduke. So we went back to this one and, and fixed some stuff on the eight string, and and. Uh, I find it really interesting that, that you say about the mono switch because I find that, um, at least with my look, I'm I'm only learning at the moment, but I find that you can play it as two instruments, but you can also play it as one instrument. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things that um, Mark improved on the original stick pickup design was that there there was so much crosstalk in the original stick, and also so much microphonicness that sometimes the other instruments in the room would leak into the pickup. Right. And Mark, when Mark went to the, the you haven't, you'd never had to have that experience. No, 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 I haven't. <laughs> have the trumpet player in the room opening your, going into your pickup. Uh, uh, I do Mark remember the spinal tap though, where they, you know, when he's playing the solo and it's got the, 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 the airport air force base and they've got the, the, the plane <laughs> landing instructions. I remember that one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so Mark sorted out the crosstalk issue right. between the two strings, which which allowed you to really do two different sounds. You could really have distortion on one side or or um, uh, a delay on one side, and there wasn't crosstalk. And so that opened up a lot. But then I went to the, the mono instrument for a few years, and then I went back to the stereo when, when Crimson went to a four-piece. And that's when Mark, we kind of worked on the, the, the artist designed tin string. and. Um, you know, he, he, we decked it out with the piezo pickups and the, the MIDI, and um, it doesn't really need to be all decked out like that. I don't, I don't, I actually didn't, I, I did some really cool stuff with the MIDI, but it was, but um, it's a lot of hassle to have the MIDI. Mm. And the, yeah, yeah. So that's kind of where the, the, the TG artist came in. Well, that's, that's pretty awesome. And so then what are you playing now? Like where, where, where have you evolved to with your, your instruments and your playing? Well, I still have, I still have, oh, well, here's the TG artist, I guess. Um, I still have this one. Uh, look how dark that Paduke is. It's wow, just that's like, beautiful. It's really dark now. Um, I, okay, so, so my story is, this is my main instrument. This one, uh, actually, I know it's not exactly show and tell, but check this thing out. <laughs> Maybe you've seen pictures of it. Mark had this idea of doing a, a, a semi-hollow body. And we ended up, he wanted to make me one. I was like, could we do fretless? And he's like, yeah. And I was like, but I'm, I never really played fretless. And I was kind of afraid of it. So we did a double bass where wow. it's half fretless and half fretted. And it turned out 
the fretted side, I don't really like it. Right. Well, I, what's unique about this instrument is that there's only a piezo pickup and the strings are nylon. Nylon, right. So, wow. So there's no, you can't even have a magnetic pickup on it. Wow. And what's amazing, and you know, the bass sound is amazing on this. And I, wow. I actually use this all over the uh, um, King Crimson Power, Power to Believe record because the bass sound is so fat and round. And it's it's kind of um, piezo and those pickups, those, I mean, the, those giant, they're like giant classical guitar strings. They just have this upright bass growly thing uh and i love that so so that one and this one are pretty much the only ones i play now but getting to your question is um my hands and wrists and elbows were getting so messed up from playing that i became nervous about being able to play into my old age which i want to be able to do and i had been experimenting with uh the last few years with Crimson, because I had this fretless, I wanted to use it on stage, but I also wanted to have the fretted, like I had done some things where I had overdubbed the fretted and the fretless, or like the top side of the instrument and the fretless, and I wanted, I, I kind of wanted them both. And so what I ended up figuring out how to do was I put the fretted one on this keyboard stand over here, kind of like, oh yeah, kind of like that. And so it would be standing up on stage and I could wear the fretless and I could play this on like the keyboard. And there was something cool about that. And I, and I, when I got home after the first tour uh, where I was doing that, um, started playing around with the instrument on my lap and it's like, man, there's some cool stuff that you can do here that I can't quite do here. Right. And also I, and then a few years later, I was having so much issue with my wrists that I, started to play more horizontally and then i did some serious experimenting with it and i discovered so many amazing things about playing horizontally and so that's pretty much how i play now right um I and how do you feel a, after a tour is your, your wrists good and your hands good does it changed everything yeah i mean look at this that's what we have to do to get around yeah, the sure neck. yeah that's right yeah and even even this hand, uh, see if I can demonstrate it. Even this hand, it's not, it's not here. It kind of does this when you go down low. Yeah. And horizontally. It, yeah. But what the, what the weird thing was, and this is when I was still in touch with Mark and Mark was still building at the time. Um, we were talking about building a horizontal instrument and I was like, Mark, I, I started taking this way of playing very seriously and I sat down and just one of the things that I did for quite a while was I would just play on one string and see what I could find on one string. And the whole string is accessible to you this way instead right. of this way. So it, it was really like I have a, the left hand is kind of a movable nut and the right, right hand. Yes. Is, and, and I said, Mark, I'm playing this and I feel like the dynamic range is just like I, I i just don't have any control over it like notes are jumping out other notes are quieter and i'm a pretty good player you know i can play pretty well but i feel like I, i'm back in kindergarten and there's i don't have control of this and i need to figure out like why why is there so much there's more dynamic range and he's like oh maybe it's because the strings are horizontal and you're playing down and we looked at it closer and closer and it turns out i'm convinced of this that when the wrist is bent like this and you're playing, there's actually physical compression in all the right. tendons. Makes sense. And yeah. I'm not, I'm not actually have very much dynamic range. It's more like I'm just hitting. And as soon as I got here and got relaxed, I really had to go back to ground zero got kindergarten again and get control of the dy dynamic range. So, uh, so Mark and I talked a long time about building things and then he, he's, he's not building anymore and i i was able to play i mean i've probably been doing this for 10 years now on my lap um i don't always play like that like when i'm doing a rock show it, it feels kind of weird to sit down so it's not very rock and roll sitting down with it on your lap <laughs> yeah but i can do really cool stuff 
And so I've been kind of waiting until I found just the right builder because I felt like if I went well, out and so asked on that, I, everyone is going to say, everyone's going to say, oh, yeah, I can build that for you. I was like, well, hold on. It's not that simple. Well, so, um, yeah. you know, I've been, I've been talking with Pete Hannawinkle, who apparently built most of the guitars for Mark. Mark was, he was, and so Pete's building my new one, um, and I've custom designed that. Um, and so um, I don't know what the whole story is, but, but, you know, maybe it's worth having a chat to him because he's, Mark's allowed him to now build war guitars again. So he's. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I'm actually working with a guy now who, who we're, we're very far into it. Okay, um, cool. He's a, he's a, He's a kind of bass player. He built his own instrument. Um, he's in this band called Buke and Gase from New York. You ever heard of these guys? No. Uh, you got to look them up. They're crazy. He plays this eight-string instrument that's a bass and a guitar, but he doesn't tap. He built it himself. It's just a duo. And then uh, they're both named Aaron. And then the other Aaron, she plays an electric ukulele. Like a, like it looks like a miniature little Telecaster or something, and she sings. They both sit down and they both have like he's got a kick drum on one foot and a snare on the other foot, and she's got like a a tom and a a, a hi hat or a tambourine or something. But it's like really heavy, super polymetric prog stuff with this weird wow. singing, and so. So I've been to, uh, and Aaron builds a lot, all sorts of instruments. He built the zithers. And what's the, what's the uh, name again, Trey? What's their name? It's B B U K E and G A S E. So Buke and Gase. That's what oh, they okay, call great. their instrument. And um, I'll, I'll send you a link to one of their records. Yeah, cool. or posts. It's fantastic. And I've heard them live, and it's amazing. Uh, anyway, he's built he's built uh, the zithers for the Blue Man Group, and he built all sorts of instruments and. We've been talking and started working. And so we're going to build a mono seven string instrument, fanned fretboard. This, the, the bass string is going to be really long. Yeah, right. And, and so we're playing around with this, um, you know, headless tuners. And we're, we're kind of still conceptualizing and trying right. to figure out things. But I, I, I'm super excited about That's it. That's exciting, it be, yeah. It will be, right now I'm kind of, I've made this thing work great on my lap, but it's a little bit, uh, it's not totally integrated. So I'm going to have a, we're starting with just a seven string, just a full range kind of classic thing and see how it goes. And so what are you doing in terms of, you still touring and, um, oh, well, you started touring again or? No, no, I haven't started touring yet. I mean, I did some shows uh, this last August. I've been, uh, Tony Levin invited me out to their uh, King Crimson Three of a Perfect Pair camp last okay. year but they canceled right. because of the pandemic and uh this year i went out there for a week and and taught some classes and then did shows with him and adrian and pat and that was cool it was kind of freaky to be out to be out in public yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> um uh, mostly i'm i'm working my my music i mean i teach a lot but mostly i i'm working on recording um i'm recording an intense war guitar project right now which is i've been writing um, fully composed, no improv at all pieces for a couple of war guitars, no other instruments. So it's wow, kind of awesome. looking at it like a like a small like a string quartet of of, ta of tapped instruments. It doesn't really yeah, matter wow, what they awesome. are. And I'm doing it. Um, it's really intense. The music is really it's pretty wild awesome. awesome. and 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 really hard to play i'm having a hard time I have, I have to do a lot of prep work to play i spent like a year writing i've got most of it written and now i have to go back in and play it and that's what i've been working on right now oh that's yeah. that's oh, i can't wait to hear that it's going to be um yeah it's going to be cool it's going to be yeah. cool there's really some, really some cool stuff and i'm i'm able to there's a few areas that i still want to explore um just the way that instruments can interlock but also um between the playing and different I just think it's like, you know, we're, we're so blessed to have something like this that after 30 years, you're still finding new direction and you're still finding new oh inspiration. My gosh. There's so much to still explore. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. you know, so many people get so sick, sick of things, but, you know, yeah, I, I, I'm, I love it. And I've also, I've got this, I've got your book here. Oh, dear. Yeah. Yep. So, well, so for the new album, my plan is, I, I, I was going to say, don't hold me to it, but yeah, hold me to it is, um, I'm going to release the, the music with a full score. And even I'm planning on um, 
because I would love for other people to play this stuff, not me. Uh, uh, full score, and also um, I'm hoping like some uh, preparatory exercises, like how you get how you get yeah. to how to how to break down these parts to get to, to playing them, because well, some of them are challenging, but also just the stamina of, of like rocking through a whole seven minute piece. Yeah, well, that's, um, yeah. that's something I, I look forward to that 100%. I'll yeah. be right onto that as soon as it's released. <laughs> yeah. So, mate, so look, it's, it's it's just awesome having you on. I just love, you know, you're just an icon of the of the instrument and, and such an inspiration. And it's just great talking about the instrument itself. And, you know, obviously we could talk all day about your incredible career, but I just think for me that the, this show and talking about the instrument and, and where it came from and how it's, elevated your your musical journey and how you know it's inspired you i just think it's great and i'm just really honored to have you on and having a, a chat with you about it so thanks so much trey awesome. it's amazing well thanks for having me so it's, it's always a it's always i find it a pleasure to talk about this stuff i don't know if everyone else does but i do well you know uh, there's enough weird people out there i think that uh, that <laughs> like it that, you know hopefully we can be the uh, the COVID 19 of of getting the stick or the the, the touch dial instruments out there spread the virus you know yeah, probably yeah. a bad analogy yeah. at this time, but you know, it was the only one that okay, came well, to my mind. <laughs> All right, nice. Trey. Well, thanks again, bud. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. Take care, mate. Bye.